road that leads to life. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. Here we go. I'll take you at your word. I'll take you at your word. If you say And the chaos fell in line. You spoke, and the chaos fell in line. Well, I know because I've seen it in my life. I know because I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to life. It's a narrow road that leads to life. But I want to be on it. It's a narrow road. The tide is high. It's a narrow road, the tide is high. Cause you parted the waters, I'll take you, I'll take you at your word. If you say it, I believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your you said your love will never give up. You said your love will never give up. You said your grace is always enough. You said your heart will never forget or forsake me. You said I'm saved. You said I'm saved. You call me yours. You said my future is full of your Your love will never give up. You said your love will never give up. You said your grace is always enough. You said your heart would never forget or forsake me. You said I'm saved. You said I'm saved. You call me yours. You said my future is full of your hope. Let's all sing that together again. And I think what the kids did was kind of do a fist pump, right? So when we sing those words, I'll take you at your word, everyone go, I'll take you at your word. And I think we all have to do it so that we do it up here. Does that sound good? All right, ready? One, two, three. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I believe. I've seen how good. I've seen how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete. I'll take you at your word. Take you at your word. If you start it, you'll complete. One last time. I'll take you at your word. If you say it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start good that was so good saw a lot of fist pumps good job guys we all can stay standing we're gonna keep worshiping or sit whatever feels good you guys are tired it's been a long night
You're the God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, your faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you said. All the storms, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn with speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness Though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. God, from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true, though the storms may come. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain stay. Let my heart and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithful, great is your faithfulness to me, great is your faithfulness to me from the Setting, saying my will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Sing this together. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. worship song and just to give you all context these are all songs that these guys all sang this week so I texted Kathy and Luke about midweek and I said any songs standing out so I think it's pretty cool that we can join in the worship that these kids and teenagers worshiped with all week so Lord I just want to gather our hearts as we continue and end in this song we just cover all of our campers all of our counselors Luke and Kathy and the staff we lift you up for all that you've done this week. And we pray that you would seal every miracle, every promise, every word spoken in your name and your name alone. We exalt you, Jesus. You're worthy of it all. Let's sing this together. There was a moment when the lights went out. There was a moment when the lights went out, when death had claimed its victory. 
death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history The darkest day in history They're on a cross They're on a cross they made for sinners for every curse is blood atoned. For every curse is blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished. One final breath and it was finished. But not the end we could have known. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake. For the earth began to shake. And the veil was torn. sacrifice was made what sacrifice was made heavens roared and the heavens roared all hail King Jesus all hail King Jesus all hail the Lord of heaven and When all was lost, he crossed eternity. When all was lost, he crossed eternity. The king of life was on the moon. The king of life was on the moon. In a dark, cold tomb. In a dark, cold tomb where our Lord was laid. Where our Lord was laid. One miraculous breath. One miraculous breath. We're forever changed. Jesus, we do. We recognize your grandeur, your, your power, your goodness, your presence, even here, your work through history, the hope for the future. God, our hope rests in you. And Lord, we lift our voices as a community to say you are God and we are not. And we surrender the little universes we've created unto ourselves, the little power structures and plans that we have 
tried to keep you out of. And we just say, Lord, we open our hands and say, God, we don't want you out of anything. We want you in all of it. And so this morning as a church, we just praise you and hail you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, grab a seat, y'all. Grab a seat. It is so encouraging to look around. I just, um, I didn't go up this year. I've, I've been up to Hume so, like, probably 16, 17, 18 times. And there's something, there's something that happens when you're day after day after day spending time away from the sort of toxic pipeline of social media, away from the obligations and the identities that are sort of stuck to you when you're in your sort of neighborhood and hometown. And when you're out in this beautiful space and what you're exposed to every day after day is truth about who God is and who you are. And so for those of us like me that are kind of coming in and we're looking over the fence at this excited group, kind of tired but excited group of students, I hope we can learn something. And maybe, especially as we're getting those of us that are like me with a little more gray in the beard, that we can remember that moment where we learned something about God or we saw God differently than we always thought God was. And it sort of surprised us. And it opened up a whole new horizon of possibilities. A lot of students, this happened this week. And so I just... I want to thank you students for getting here, for waking up, and for being a part of it. And whether you went to camp or not, this is a moment for all of us to kind of marinate in what happened and who God is right here, the same as he was up there. And so this morning is going to be about celebration. It's going to be about hearing stories. We're going to open the word and hear about Jesus. We're going to sing some songs, get in the water maybe a little bit. Um, but... If you're new with us, I, we just want to say welcome. If you're new to this whole Jesus thing, or you're like, what is going on here? Um, we're all a bunch of weirdos with or without Jesus, so we might as well have Jesus. And uh, we just invite you to say, you know, to, to enjoy and to be part of it. And you belong here this morning. Um, and we're so excited to share this time with you. Only thing I want to mention is normally we have two services. Uh, one here at the beach at 8.30, soft start, 8.30. And then one at the Catalina Room at 10.30, but uh, we're only having one today, so we're all together. But next week, we resume our normal schedule, and so that'll be wonderful. Um, but with no further ado, what I want to do, uh, something we do every single, every single service, is just take a minute. In our, in our service, I know there's a lot of us, so this might be a little wrangling we'll be doing, but we just want to, um, just for a minute, stand up, say hi to somebody, and then I'm going to call you back, and we're going to continue on. Um, with the adventure of our morning. So there's coffee back there as well. So say hi to someone, and um, and I'll call you back in a minute. Thought that I was all alone, broken and afraid, but you and Luke, we want you to preach. Uh, you have an incredible insight into Scripture and your life. And the second part is also you've been up there all week, and so you're kind of really in touch with what's been going on. And so I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to step away and let's, let's hear some truth and then some, share some stories and do this thing. So, Lord, thanks so much for Luke. Bless this man. Um, I just pray you would, this morning for all of us sitting here, God, we need truth. We need shalom. We need um, a quieting of our hearts, many of us. We need sort of cleaning of our glasses to see the world, to see reality from your perspective, and God, this morning we ask you take us in, in that direction. And so here we are. Speak, we are listening, and Jesus, we worship you and hail you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, James. Uh, like James said, I'm the youth pastor. I was up with your students all week up at camp, and it was fantastic and fun. Yeah, thank you. Um <clears throat> And James is going to pass a hat around. If he doesn't think it's enough, he's going to pass it around again. And I'm just kidding. Of course, don't. Um, it really is my joy to be up there with your kids. The week that I have to spend uh, to counsel, to pastor, to shepherd uh, is, is my joy. 
It is. You have some wonderful students, uh, but they are also a bit troublesome at times, as you know, as parents and as community members. Uh, and so I am in a state of deep exhaustion right now. Uh, I was worshiping and closing my eyes. I think I fell asleep standing up. So that's where I am. So if I say some things that don't make sense, that's why. Uh, if you've never been to camp, the state of exhaustion that our counselors and youth pastors come back in is kind of like the second week of having a newborn. We were just like, the adrenaline is worn off, and now you're just like, uh, you can fall asleep at any second. Uh. But so happy, too. So happy that you have this little bundle of joy. And for me, so happy that we've got to witness God move in such incredible and powerful ways in so many students' lives. So it is in this deep state of exhaustion and joy that uh, I'm sitting here in this moment, holding that our God has been working. And we find ourselves at the church, if you're visiting us, at kind of a, a crossroads. We have two stories going on at the same time. One is all of us have just come back from camp, and the other one is that our church has been in this journey through the scriptures. We've been coming along at the very beginning seeing how the whole Bible is this one unified story that all points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. The story of the scriptures, all of history, everything in our lives, everything points to him. And that's what we've been looking at together as a church this summer, and that is what we're going to be looking at this morning. So I'm going to lead us into the scriptures. We're going to be in, in two passages of scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them up. Uh, we are going to start in Isaiah chapter 6, and then we'll find ourselves in John chapter 1. So first, Lord, be with whatever is happening over there. Amen. I'm just going to try to keep going through that. It's distracting me. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can pay attention through that. All right. Um, <clears throat> So Isaiah chapter 6, then John chapter 1, and then we're going to have a time for communion, uh, a time for our students to share what God did up at camp, and then we'll have some baptisms at the end. So that's our morning together. Hopefully that gave you enough time to open up to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. What's happening here is Isaiah is getting a vision of the God that we worship, an incomprehensibly glorious God. This is what we've been learning up at camp, that we have an incomprehensibly glorious God. The theme of camp was El Elyon, God Most High, seeing God as God Most High. And throughout scripture, we get to see and understand who God is. And Isaiah, the prophet here, gets a peek behind the curtains. He gets to look into the heavenly realm. He gets to see who our God is in heaven as he sits enthroned. This is what's happening, and it happens when King Uzziah died. Now, I know you are all history buffs and know exactly who this person is. King Uzziah was king for 52 years. We have presidents for four years. Sometimes eight, the longest one, 16, right? Imagine your life, 52 years, the same king, the same ruler. He's the one who's dictating everything, political, social. He's setting the tone for everything. When a king who is king for 52 years dies, there is an instability in the country, socially, economically, politically. Like everything is at unrest. And this is the time when, king, or when Isaiah gets the vision. At this time, other nations would be looking at Israel trying to attack them. Can this new king is going to come defend them? And what does Isaiah see? What does Isaiah see but the one king who's truly on the throne? The one king of Israel who is truly reigning. Isaiah sees kings come and kings go. 
we see presidents come and presidents go. And many of us are thinking, thank goodness, that whatever happens in the next election cycle is not going to be forever. It's not. Kings come, kings go, presidents come, presidents go. But Isaiah sees and shows us for the people of God, there is one king who is forever on the throne, God most high. He says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his, the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were seraphim. Seraphim are these angelic beings in the presence of God. And these angelic beings in the presence of God are just overwhelmed about how holy God is. So they're singing to each other, holy, holy, holy. The, her, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is this word that means set apart. It means other. They are looking at God as other, other, other. Holy, sanctified, holy, separate. And students of Hebrew and yourself, so you might know that in Hebrew, when they want to emphasize something, they repeat it twice. They really want you to understand. They say, holy, holy. They repeat it twice. And this is one of the only places in the Hebrew Bible that something is repeated three times. You're supposed to get and understand as readers of this text that there is no one nor anything like Yahweh like their God, like El Elyon, God Most High, holy, holy, holy. And it's not just us humans saying that. It's not Isaiah saying it who's getting this vision. It's the angelic beings are in the very presence of God. And we know through scripture that you have to be without sin to be in the presence of God. So these angelic beings are also morally perfect there without sin, and all they can say, holy, 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 holy. There is something about Yahweh, something totally other that we cannot even comprehend. It feels like the seraphim are grasping at the leash of language, just trying to articulate being in the very presence of God. Holy, holy, holy. Other. Completely other. Completely morally perfect. Complete perfection of love. Everything other. In the book of Revelation, it picks up this same picture and says that they're singing this day and night. They don't stop. That means when we were up at camp all last week, these angelic beings singing, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. That means when we went to bed last night, these angelic beings were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole time while you were asleep, when you wake up right now, It doesn't stop. Day and night, our Lord is being worshipped. Holy, holy, holy. We worship an incomprehensibly glorious God. His otherness to us, his perfection, his beauty, his love, his mercy, his justice, his peace is so other, incomprehensibly glorious. Holy, holy, holy. So Isaiah sees this. He sees the image of a holy God. And what is his reaction? His reaction is not, oh, that's cool. It's not, his reaction is not, oh, I should Instagram this. <laughs> Let me make sure I snap this. He's not trying to film it. His reaction to this is, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips who dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips. His reaction in the presence of a holy God would be our very same reaction as well. When we're in the presence of God, who is beautiful and good, his goodness so powerful, our reaction is, whoa, I am a sinner. I have unclean lips. How can I be in this presence? Woe is me. And I dwell amongst sinners as well. Woe is me. We, brothers and sisters, are just like Isaiah. When we understand who God is, we understand more of the depths of our brokenness. 
In Romans chapter 3, 23, you might know it well if you grew up in the church, said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, just like Isaiah, sinners in need of the mercy and grace of God. Some of you, I mean, we all like to think that we're good people. Most of us are. I think all of us are, I hope. But we're sinners, broken in need of God's mercy and grace, sinners that hurt people, sinners that hurt our relationship with God. Now, one illustration I used when talking about this with the campers this last week was imagine with me that we had the technology that a chip was implanted into your brain. And I'm sure we're probably not too far away from that. But this little chip is really cool that it can publicly show all of your thoughts, all of your words, and all of your actions to the whole world. It goes one central database is getting to see every single person's thoughts, every single person's words, and every single person's actions. How many of you guys would want that in your brain? (laughs) Spouses, how many of you want all of your thoughts about your spouse getting made publicly known? Yeah, probably not, probably none of us. I know I wouldn't, but God knows. He knows every single thought. Every single word, every single action. Sinners, all of us, broken, all of us, in need of the mercy and grace of God. All of us together, like Isaiah. And so what happens? Isaiah chapter 6. So he says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Glory. Beauty. The seraphim know that this is the desire and heart of our God. He takes something from the altar the place where sacrifices were made. And he goes and touches the lips, the very thing that he said, woe to me for I am a sinner. And he says, your sin is taken away. Your guilt is atoned for. Mercy. Grace. This is what we all need. And this is the story of the Bible, is that we are sinners who need the mercy and grace of God to atone for our sins. All of us sinners need God's mercy, needs his grace, and we need the sacrifice provided at the altar for us. We have an incomprehensibly glorious God, and we've been separated from him by our sin. But the good news is that God draws near to us to draw us near to himself. Let me repeat that. God draws near to us, an incomprehensibly glorious God comes near to me, comes near to you, comes near to humanity throughout creation so that we might draw near to him. Our God is recreating Eden. That's his goal. That's his objective. He is calling us sinners into his very presence so that we may know life in its fullness. God created Adam and Eve, and he was with them. We as humans were intended to design and rule all the whole world with God. And we know from the story with Adam and Eve that they chose and thought that they could create Eden themselves. They could define what good and evil was for themselves. And we know also that all of that is inside of us. And so sinners cannot be in the presence of a holy God. And so they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. The next thing that we see is Cain and Abel outside of the garden, right? And what are they doing? Offering sacrifices. Instruction, teaching that Torah sacrifice is going to be necessary. And the story continues and we see God drawing near to the people of Israel. He is selecting people that are going to be his grace to the nation. God drawing near. The people of Israel have God tabernacled among them. You might remember the tent that was set up. That's God's very presence, though veiled, in the people of Israel, God draws near. This holy, un- incomprehensible, glorious God draws near. But there's rules, there's regulations, right? The place where he resides, the most holy place, there's regulations on who can enter and how. 
The most holy place has one priest, the high priest, who can come in once a year, and that with a rope tied around his leg in case he dies. Just his very presence entering in once a year is after they had offered a sacrifice for the atonement of sins. God draws near. And the story continues in the temple, and the story continues. So now with me, let's continue our story in John chapter 1. Would you turn with me to John chapter 1? John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Look, he said, behold, John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sacrifice that we've always needed. The only thing that can atone for our sins, the only thing that can lead us back into the presence of God. John says, look, behold, there he is. Behold. Church, behold. Pay attention. Wake up. Look. There he is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want you to see clearly and understand fully. Jesus is the sacrifice that we need. That all of scripture was pointing towards. The Lamb of God. Now scholars debate what exactly John meant when he called Jesus the Lamb of God. But we can infer at least two things from this. One, we think John clearly sees Jesus as the Passover lamb. Now, if you remember in our sermon on the Exodus, you would remember the events of Passover. That God led the people of Israel out of slavery from Egypt and into this new promised land that he was showing him. Here we see Jesus leading us in the greater Exodus. As the Passover lamb who is sacrificed, he is redeeming us from sin to new life in him. As the Passover lamb, Jesus is leading us in a greater exodus away from sin. Scholars also think that this lamb of God may mean and refer back to the day of atonement, when there is a sacrifice made for the sins of Israel, that the people would be made at one with God again. That relational equity, I guess, is restored, that our relational connection with God would become at its fullness again. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. Jesus, our Lamb, sacrificed for you and for me. Friends, brothers and sisters, this is what we need. You were created to be in relationship with God. That's what you were made for. And our sin separates ourselves from that relationship. But Jesus has made the way. Because of his sacrifice, because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the way is open now for you to enter that relationship again. You were designed for a relationship with the triune God and can do so through the blood of Jesus. So what I'd like to end with is a command. And the command is not my own. It's from scripture. It's from the book of Hebrews. The command is this. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. Why? Why? Because Jesus has made the way. In the epistle of Hebrews, he's dealing with all the theology of this. If you're confused by what I just shared because I went through it quickly, just read that book and you'll understand it. He's saying, because of all this, because Jesus has paved the way, draw near to God. Jesus has made the way for us to enter into the most holy of holy places. 
the very place that was restricted for one person once a year, the high priest with a rope around his foot, is now available to you and to me all the time. Why? Because the blood of Jesus. Draw near. Because his blood has paved the way. Draw near. Because you have confidence in the full assurance that faith brings. Draw near. I can't begin to explain how glorious and good this is. Like, this doesn't even begin to articulate. Like, we get to enter into the very life of the triune God. The Father who loves us sent his Son to die for us, to make the way, and then by the blood of the new covenant, the Holy Spirit resides in us. With the Holy Spirit residing in us, we now get to participate in the very life of the triune God. Think about that glory. The incomprehensibly glorious God is inviting you into the participation of his very life and nature. Glory. Mercy. What you are always designed for. Relationship with the triune God. Glory. Mercy. Draw near. I command this from scripture, and I want you to hear me clearly, is that our world desperately needs it. Our students desperately need it. Students, your schools desperately need it. We need people who are so caught up into the glory and beauty of God. They're so filled with the spirit that they will change their lives and communities as God works through them. We need this draw near to God. Our world needs this. Draw near to God. Our schools need this. Draw near to God. You need it. Draw near to God. Draw near. The way is open. Come close. In just a moment after our students share about uh, their time up at camp and how God has come close to them and where they saw God moving, I'm going to invite us to go to the table. At the table is where we see and can physically practice our closeness to God. This is where we are reminded of the sacrifice that he made. It's where we are reminded of our union with him, his body, his blood for us, given, shed. At the table, we see and participate our oneness, our way into the most holy of holy places, the blood of the new covenant, which is his spirit given and living in us. So as you take it this morning, proclaim to yourself, I am drawing near. So what I'm going to invite now is for all the students who are up at camp to come up here. And Miss Kathy, can you come up as well? And we're going to take some time to hear from our students about how God has drawn near to them and the ways that God has shown up up at camp. So if you went to camp, student counselor, anyone, would you come on up? That means all you boys too. Yeah, come on, I know. Thank you. All right. I'll let Miss Kathy take it away for a bit. Um, so church family, <clears throat> We didn't go up to the mountain alone. Um, I want to thank you for, th there are like a hundred of you. I, I actually don't know the number, but we were supported in by prayer teams over each individual cabin. So we took four busloads of kids up to Hume Lake. And so we didn't go alone. We went with you guys, your prayers, your support, you knowing what was going on up there, you being very intentional about prayer for these kids and their lives. And so I want to just thank you for that. It means so much to us. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit's presence and God's moving, God moving before us. So, um, and thank you, Luke. That was a beautiful sermon. Um, so and we're going to enter into the holiness of God now as we get to hear from the students. Um, you guys, I would ask that you'd be really brave and speak up because when we declare the glory of God, like our body of Christ, it, it grows and benefits from your words, and we are giving honor to God. So um, anybody who would like to say what 
what God in, did in their lives up there or just want to give praise to God, the mic is open for you. And you can come up to me. There you go. Um, this week, I think that God has just shown me how important it is to be a disciple of Christ and to share his love with everyone around me. Thank you, Kate. Um, this week, I learned about God, um, or I learned about Jesus, and, and I like learned so much stuff I didn't know, and I never thought of him the way I thought of him this week. So it was really powerful to me to like know what Jesus can do and like ha how he does it. And like I just didn't think of him the way I thought of him. Thanks, Rex. Finley. This week I had a really great time worshiping and praising God, and it just felt so good to be with everyone else around me. Thanks, Finley. Um, this week I learned that God was man and the Lord, and that he died for our sins. On, you guys, it's your moment. This week, I learned that God is the firm foundation I should build my life on. Mm. Uh, this week, God taught me the importance and power of forgiveness. I got to see how God grew in other people and got to grow closer to God. Thank you, River. This week I saw God uh, in our counselors, Will, Jay, and Corey, who were given the ability to answer our very difficult questions during cabin time. So, yeah. All right, uh, this week I saw God uh, work in my heart and, and tell me to be bold in my faith with the people closest to me. And uh, I also saw him work kind of like Cayman and our counselors and uh, their extreme patience to deal with uh, all the stuff we put them through. So. I know, because at 2.30 I heard a bell ring and a huge crowd of boys going, hoo, 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 hoo. And then the last night, every hour, that bell rang. <laughs> you should come. It's great. Um, you guys, let's give more glory to God. Let's just talk about how God moved up there at Hume Lake. If he moved your heart, this is not a scary thing to do. Um, this week, I saw God's love give me strength. Awesome. Want to say something? There you go, Orla. Um, this week, I saw that God died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bailey? Devin? <laughs> Any of you guys? Max? So, um, as you can see, there's a lot of new faith up here. And so what I would ask is, as the River family, that you would continue to pray for their journey and their relationship with God. And that it wouldn't just be prayer, but it, that there would be intention, that when you look up here and see these kids' faces, if you know them or if you don't know them yet, know that we ask you in. We invite you to support our kids' journey of faith in life. It takes at least five or six of you to pour into and mentor each one of these kids so that they would taste of the glory of God. So don't be afraid. Know that you're wanted. I see all of you out there, and I invite you in to be with us. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, just stay up here one more quick sec. We have a, a couple of students, at least, who want to get baptized today, and I've asked them just to share with you all um, publicly the decision why they're getting baptized. And as Kathy was saying, this is for them, but also for you, uh, that these are at least a couple of faces that you know that you and us as a community are committed to supporting them in their faith journey as we welcome them in into the community of God. So 
Would you be so bold to come on up? Thank you. Yeah, you can give him a round of applause. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So we've had conversations up at camp around baptism and what it is uh, and the decision that they're making. So I just want you to share again with this community here the decision or of why you're getting baptized. Um, okay, so I'm getting re-baptized. I was baptized as a baby, but after this week, I decided to make the decision to give my life to Christ and to follow him. And so now I want to re- I want to get baptized again to make that decision consciously. Um, my name is Sasha Wautoag, um, and I've decided to get baptized today because um, I truly want to like live by the word of the God. And this past week at Hume has helped me realize that Jesus is my savior. And um, yeah, I just think I need to trust that. Thanks, Vivi. Thanks, Sasha. Um, <clears throat> So in just a moment, we're going to uh, have time for communion, and then we'll head down to the water to baptize these girls. And um, if there's other students that want to get baptized, uh, would you please come t talk to me or Miss Kathy right after this, uh, and we can walk through that decision with you. Uh, and then there's going to be time for communion as well. Um, so I'm going to pray, and after I pray, there's going to be some music, uh, and you're welcome to take communion, and then we invite that you join us down by the water as well uh, for the baptism of these students. Uh, and we just logistically, can you make sure that there's a clear line of sight that the lifeguard has to the water for everyone's safety? They need to be able to see what's happening in the water. So just make sure that the lifeguard there has a clean line of sight for us. All right, church, would you pray with me? God, you are holy. We have declared that this morning, and the students have declared it this week at camp, and we submit ourselves under you, an incomprehensibly glorious God. You have made the way for us to enter into life with you by the blood of your Son, the sacrificial Lamb. So, Father, we draw close to you now and ask that you would move in our hearts, convict us of our sin, and lead us into life in the name of your Son, Jesus. So, Father, as we uh, enter into a time of communion and baptism, we recognize these as um, sacred acts, um, holy acts that remind us of our need for you and our participation now in the union of your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, be present here. May you be clearly known and glorified in our hearts and lives. And we say this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the time is yours, the table is open, and we will walk down for baptism. <clears throat>